is Pat Solver with the Dr. Ways In, and um, I'm really excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Richard Migliori. Did I say it right? Perfect. <laughs> Good, great. He is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, and um, excuse me, Executive Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer of United Health Group, and that's a big job at a big company. So we're delighted you could take some time to be with us today. And as in, in his role at United Healthcare, he works with uh, businesses across the enterprise on healthcare quality, access, and affordability, all super important issues. And what we're going to talk about today is the work that uh, United Healthcare has been doing in response to the COVID 19 pandemic. So, welcome, Dr. Bigliori. Thank you. Uh, so what I wanted to start with is, you know, we're starting to open up the country now. And as we start to open up the country, people are still afraid, which is kind of slowing down the opening up. And one of the things that will help us all feel safer is when we have either preventive agents or treatment or vaccines. But we all know that drug development and vaccine development in ordinary times is very slow, it takes decades to get a drug to market. But during this pandemic, there are a lot of things that have been happening to accelerate um, the uh, development of drugs, uh, including the, um, the emergency approval program that's been taking place. And I know that United Health Group is actually working in the area of clinical trials of drugs that will help in the pandemic. So can you tell us a little bit about that? What's the, what's the role of the health plan sure. in clinical trials? Thank you for your introduction. The, uh, let me start off by first describing a little bit about the company itself. We're a healthcare company. Our roots were in um, being a health plan. And that's the United Healthcare side of our business. Um, but the other half of our business is Optum, which is a services business, uh, in which we're doing things to help the health system be more effective and more responsive by giving it better support systems. Some of it by bringing services to it, like analytics and the like, and the, the rest of it is by actually delivering care. We have over 100,000 clinicians in the company delivering care, not only here in the U.S., but also in South America and in Portugal, and that's expanding. So that perspective has opened up our eyes as to the challenges that come across when the whole world has been challenged by this, by, by this pandemic. And as a result, uh, it's caused us to recognize you're just not about providing benefits, but also you start looking at what a health system needs. You need people who can deliver care. So they need to be healthy and on the front line. You need to have an ability for patients who call us doctor, the 30 million of them around the world that call us their doctor to have access. You wanna make sure that our 50,000 people who work in support roles to make sure that the benefit plans and the United Healthcare side of the business are operating smoothly and efficiently. And then the 52 million people who carry a United Healthcare card, you want them to, to be able to access benefits and to be supported as they seek care from their physicians. And it's about 1.3 million physicians and other clinicians in our networks. So as we deliver this care, one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that first off that, um, we are doing the very things that you described, that there's a pursuit of solutions that will either prevent the disease, such as vaccines, or treat the disease. Uh, one of the things that we've been encouraged by is the changing culture of the life sciences companies that have stepped up to be more open-minded, to be more collaborative with their competition and with the government. And so we felt we had a role to get into this. And as we pan the, uh, when we pan the, the horizon, 
we started looking at where are the places in which we could provide support, meaningful support, to further instigate the pursuit of something successful. And that led you to a collaboration with the Mayo Clinic? Yeah, we went looking across and did our research and uh, uh, started looking at what are the likely areas. And one of the areas that has been successful in the past, although not leveraged much, was the adoptive immunity by transferring Sarah, uh, sensitize Sarah to patients, to convey to patients who are just starting to experience the infection with the benefit of the immunity of a patient who successfully made their way through the infection process. It's essentially, you know, this, this virus, it takes two to three weeks to cause an individual to make the antibodies that are appropriate. Uh, in order to speed that up, we were compelled by the work that was being described uh, the, uh, among one of the biggest collaborations we've ever seen, but through a, a relationship with Dr. Michael Joyner down at Mayo Clinic. And they had put to test the notion of being able to take convalescent sera from patients who have survived this infection and to transfer it to patients who were, uh, I, I would describe that, who were severely affected in terms of the respiratory pattern. The thing that was most exciting about this was that this collaboration was enormous and it involved places like Johns Hopkins and Mount Sinai and a variety of other places, as well as local community hospitals. And much like we saw with the the new alliances on the life sciences side of the business, when you see academic and clinical medicine getting together like that, that is something very special. Typically, these are competitive relationships. This has become very cooperative. And what we thought we can do, and I called Mike and talked about it, I said, what can we do to support it? He says, well, he says, the size of this collaboration is enormous. We're going to need help in terms of administering these programs, if you could provide the financial support that could give us the booster shot to help us expand and to keep track of the IRB related items and the processing of patients, et cetera, we said we could use that help. And we sat back and thought this was worthy. It was, you know, it, it, there's some proven track record with SARS and a couple of other viruses in the past about the use of convalescent plasma. Why don't we put a bet on the table here? And so we did. And we uh, gave Mike to work five, to, to, and the Mayo Clinic $5 million to support this multi-center effort. And the growth in this thing has been really impressive. When we first got there, they were just about at 2,000 patients. They now have 24,000 patients in wow. the world. 18,000 of them have received their transfusion. They've been able to provide enough leadership and collaboration that what was merely a handful of centers is now some over some 2,400 centers participating. That's uh, fantastic. If we know from clinical trials in the past, what makes them so slow is the recruitment of patients. So it sounds like you were able to play a role, not just with the funding, but perhaps also in getting the word out that if, you, if you're eligible for the trial, let us help you get into the trial. Yeah, you're very perceptive. We communicated with, you know, the the 140 million people that we serve and you know, brought visibility to what's going on uh, and certainly made it public and communicated externally, even people who have nothing to do with our business to make it very evident that the work that's going on here is important. It is encouraging to, uh, uh, in terms of its, uh, or it's promising 
in terms of its ability to, to deliver uh, an effective treatment. And we've been very pleased with the uh, recruitment of, you know, uh, there are 7,000 doctors now participating in this thing. There are, you know, the 24,000 enrolled patients and the like. I mean, this thing has grown exponentially in a very short period of time. Yeah, it's amazing. So I did have a chance to take a look at the uh, papers. That w One of the other things that's happened in the pandemic is we're seeing a lot more papers get published before peer review because it's one thing to finish the study and it's another thing to have to wait 18 months or two years to make it through the peer review process. So I was really happy to see that it looks like there's evidence of safety and yes. There's also evidence that it works, at least in people who weren't super, super sick. So it looks right. like it worked better in non-intubated as opposed to intubated patients. Yeah, you're, you're right. The stuff is prior to peer review, uh, and that needs to be done. But the visibility and transparency of the system is a brand new world, as you know we both know, in terms of being able to see things going through the review process. Uh, and it's important now. I mean, we're, we're dealing with people whose lives and outcomes are determined in 14 days. We don't have time to go through the usual uh, areas. And that's why the help that the federal government has given in terms of calling this an emergency, providing extended access programs, providing uh, emergency use authorizations for other things has been very helpful. And we know we're walking into this knowing that this doesn't have all the safeguards of control that we typically have in a peer-reviewed world with scientific publications and the like. But yeah, we're doing dire straits. Something you just said, I think, is, is, is really important. By opening up the papers prior to being published in a peer-reviewed journal, what you've done is you've just expanded the number of peer reviewers, right? Because yeah. everybody who reads it's going to have an opinion and have an opportunity to weigh in. And I'm sure you've published a bunch of papers. I've, the last paper I published it, I mean, I had to, I had to redo it I don't know, like four times. And some of the comments that I got back, I thought, these people don't, they didn't even read it. They didn't really even understand what the point oh, was. I, I, I remember, and I, I, I didn't think there was ever something called a final galley because there was always somebody sticking their nose in and saying, what if you did this? Or <laughs> right, right. That? But this is, it, it is important given the dire circumstance we're in that people should be able to forgive but we're moving at a pace. And I got to tell you, the scientific community, the in industry, uh, the government are all moving at a pace now that I've never, you know, that I'm, I'm just not familiar with and I'm just so encouraged by. Yeah, it is really, really encouraging. So I, I actually wanted to ask you, I mean, we're, a lot of good things, there are horrible things about the pandemic, but there are good things that are happening, I think, with respect to healthcare and this whole speeding up of, of getting drugs, but, but, but remembering to do it safely, remembering that you do need to have evidence before it gets promulgated. This collaboration that you described, the fact that people are working across competitive uh, borders and so forth, um, from, from your perspective, and, and, and telemedicine is another thing, I think this, I just read that uh, the pandemic has caused telemedicine to go from 11% of Americans trying it to more than 50% of Americans trying it, and that's in a couple of months. Um, so my question to you is twofold. One is, um, what other remarkable changes do you think we're going to see as a result of the pandemic uh, that will be good for the healthcare system, which we all know has needed reform? And then number two, um, how do you see how do you see this expanded role of United Health Group um, uh, participating not only in clinical trials but also in such things as PPE? procurement, the development and deployment of light ventilators, all these other things that, that, that the company has been doing. Is this, um, is this going to fade away after the pandemic or, or, or are there going to be lessons learned and, it'll, and you'll get even more active? 